Well, welcome everybody. This is another webinar of our Earth Day 50 years webinar series in sustainability. And we're very pleased to have Alisa Vinson once again. Uh, and by the way, my name is Armando Ueda. I'm the Florida Sea Grant agent in Sarasota County. And today we have Alisa Vinson. She is the horticulture agent in Manatee County. She joined Extension in 2019. However, she's not new to Extension because she's been working, well, she used to work at Sarasota County Extension as well um, in the county. And she, some of her primary roles as extension agent in Manatee County are the Floyd Mass Naturalist Program, bringing horticulture to her communities, opportunities to do projects with her as well, and uh, for a friendly landscaping. And today she's gonna be presented about lawns to the wildflowers, the case for pollinators gardening. And if you have questions, uh, please feel free to either use the Q&A box or the chat box and just type your questions there and we'll answer it either on the go or at the end of the presentation. And with that, Lisa, take it away. All right, thanks Armando. I'm happy to be back for another one of these in the sustainability series. Um, as Armando said, my name is Alyssa Vinson and I am here in Manatee County Extension. So um, along with the Master Naturalist Program, Florida Friendly Landscaping, um, I also manage our Master Gardener Volunteer Program. And um, my background is in ecology. So when I look at horticulture, I like to think about the ways that our personal decisions in our home landscape impact the broader environment, whether that's um, negative impacts or positive impacts. And so today I want to focus on some, um, some ways that we can increase our positive impacts for the pollinator populations uh, in the world and uh, close by to where you live. Um, so <clears throat> I want to start real quick, just if there's anybody here, I know um, uh, you probably know who we are, but just to give you a little bit of a, a brief overview, you know, what is Extension? Um, we are a function of the Land Grant University System, and our goal is to take the research that's conducted at the University of Florida and other educational institutions throughout the country and through the world and bring it back to our communities in a way that makes that information um, accessible and relatable to uh, the people in our communities and allows them to ultimately sustain and enhance the quality of human life and so that's you know we're all about um, how can we sustain and enhance our quality of life and so the sustainability webinars fit very nicely in with our overall mission as extension there is an extension office in every county in the state of Florida so if you're not familiar with yours I highly encourage you to reach out and get to know those folks so what we're going to talk about today are um, pollinators and how we can encourage uh, kind of changing some of our landscape practices to make the environment more habitable and friendly for our um, pollinator buddies. And I wanted to start just, you know, real basically just saying what are pollinators, right? I think that we all have, um, you know, we can probably name a few that we think of um, as pollinators right off the bat. And if you would go ahead and type in the chat box, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a pollinator? Bees, 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 bees. Yep. A lot of people are responding bees, um, butterflies as well. Good. Um, so most folks think of bees and butterflies um, as pollinators, and that's true. Bees and butterflies are pollinators, but there are lots of other things that also um, act as pollinators. And that includes uh, some mammals, bats. Uh, there are some plants that are pollinated exclusively by bats. There are some um, flowers that require birds for pollination, particularly hummingbirds. Um, there are um, lots and lots and lots of different kinds of insects that act as pollinators. So it's not just bees and butterflies. Uh, beetles actually have a really large role to play in pollination, as well as do um, hoverflies and ants. And so uh, when we talk about pollinators, it's important to recognize that we're not just talking about bees. And when we are talking about bees, I wanna make sure that we're not just talking about honeybees. Um, in particular, because honeybees are not native to North America. Um, honeybees were, were brought over here and have naturalized um, as a result of the 
honey industry and, and people bringing over hives from, from Europe during European colonization. So here in Florida, we actually have over 350 native species of bees that are not honeybees. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that we include um, that information when we think about pollinators. We're not just thinking about honeybees and monarch butterflies, although they're great too. They're not the only things out there pollinating. But what does a pollinator do? Well, at its very um, basic, right, the reason we call them a pollinator is because they are moving pollen between plants of the same species. Um, so they act as a facilitator of plant reproduction. And one of the really important roles of pollinators in that facilitation of plant reproduction is that they help to ensure genetic diversity. So if you have only a, a very small population of flowering plants and they're only able to reproduce within that small population of flowering plants, eventually you end up with um, with issues because of a lack of, of genetic diversity. Um, but what pollinators can do is they can bring pollen from further away and they can help increase that genetic diversity for those plants to help ensure that they're resilient to things like pests and diseases and um, either human or natural disturbances. So they um, facilitate plant reproduction, they provide necessary genetic diversity. They can be insects, birds, mammals. Because of that role, they really are an important component of our native ecosystems food webs. Um, not only are they, um, they act as food for larger organisms, they also um, will allow plants to, to fruit, right? So without pollination, a lot of our native plants wouldn't fruit and produce the food that's necessary for larger herbivores, things like, you know, gopher tortoises and things like that, that might eat gopher apple fruits. Um, so when you think about the role that pollinators play, it's not just in plant reproduction and making sure that plants, which are, are the primary producers, right, in our ecosystems, they're taking that sunlight, photosynthesizing, and creating the very basis for the food web. So, so pollinators help those plants stay alive and stay healthy to reproduce for uh, future generations. They uh, allow them to have the necessary genetic diversity that they need, but they also allow plants to fruit, which provides food for other species, larger species, birds, turtles, um, other types of mammals, bears even. So for all of those reasons, within the natural ecosystem, pollinators are uniquely important. But then outside of kind of their natural ecosystem, pollinators also have a really large role to play in agriculture. And so there's a huge economic importance to having healthy populations of pollinators, in particular when they are um, adjacent or nearby to larger agricultural operations. There's a huge industry in the country of taking uh, honeybee hives and moving them around in order to facilitate pollination of food crops. And so, you know, one of the reasons that we have this large industry is because there no longer um, exists within uh, the areas surrounding those agricultural operations a robust enough uh, population of native pollinators to, to be able to provide that pollination service. So that's what pollinators are in a nutshell. They are very economically important. But what, um, what do they look like in Florida? Well, here's just some photos. Um, these were all taken by me um, in my yard, except for the rose. Um, that was actually at the John Ringling Rose Garden um, down in Sarasota. John and Mabel uh, Ringling have a beautiful uh, rose garden outside at, at the Ringling Museum. It's gorgeous and it's accessible to everybody. Um, and that's one of my favorite native pollinators, actually, which is a sweat bee, the green sweat bee. They look like 
little tiny flying robots. <laughs> um, when the Transformers movie came out, um, I don't know how many years ago, but I saw the sweat bee and I thought, Transformer! Because <laughs> it does, does look like a little tiny robot. Um, we have, of course, got a monarch butterfly there. And then we have um, in the upper right hand side is a Gulf fritillary butterfly. I actually don't know what this guy is in the middle but he was just so gorgeous, this little beetle on a barichia flower, um, which is a um, sea oxi daisy. Um, and then we have another um, type of uh, pollinator down here on a dotted horse mint. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I love about having uh, access to these pollinators, especially with the with the dotted horse mint, is a major attractor of um, a variety of different pollinators. Is that you know you you think about honeybees and butterflies most of the time, right? But when you actually go out there and look at what's on flowers, a lot of times you're going to see these other types of insects. So it's important to be able to recognize them as pollinators and not necessarily as um, uh, an insect species that's detrimental to the plant or something that you should consider kind of controlling. Let's see, I see some things popping up in the chat here. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the Ringling Grounds are, are free for everybody to visit. And if you have little kids, they have a really nice playground. <laughs> okay, so why are we talking about um, pollinators and encouraging pollinators in our landscapes. What, what is the, what's the reason why maybe we should worry um, about our pollinator populations? And there are a lot of things that have contributed, but over the past couple of decades, there has been a, um, an observable decrease in the global um, numbers of, of insects, of invertebrates. And so, you know, the majority of pollinators are going to be in that category. They're going to be invertebrates. And so we've seen this decline in invertebrate populations. And there are, you know, there were a lot of kind of theories bouncing around about what's happening, why is it happening? And really just like everything else in nature or in, um, in ecology, you can't, you can't pinpoint one specific cause, right? Um, John Muir famously said, you can't pick one something out um, of, you know, of the universe, you find it in, attached to everything else. Um, that's a paraphrase. <laughs> Uh, but, but it's very true. You can't point to one specific cause for this um, decrease in, in invertebrate populations, but there are several reasons that we know of why populations do decrease. And um, one of the big ones is climate change. As we see more of the impacts of climate change globally, um, you know, a lot of different things are happening, not just with temperatures and rainfall, but we're also seeing changes in um, uh, climatic zone. So we've, begin, we've begun to see a shift of different plant species to different climatic zones. And when you shift, when the plant species change, the insects that normally would perform that pollination for those plants as they, as they move, right, the, the pollinators may not be there. Um, or maybe plants that used to be in one area that provided nectar for those pollinators are no longer in that area. Um, think about things like migrations of certain types of invertebrates. Monarch butterflies are very, um, very well known for this. And as climate has changed and rainfall patterns have changed, we've seen a big um, difference in, in kind of where uh, that migration is, um, or I should say how um, how vibrant and how um, frequent that um, that migration is um, is able to to complete and and whether or not the monarchs have enough food when they get to where they need to go whether they have food um, along the way um, so climate change is a big thing to think about um, especially you know as we 
in Florida, we think a lot about things like hurricanes and climate change is uh, predicted and, and has been um, documented to be changing the intensity and frequency of the storms that we get in, in the Atlantic Basin. And so uh, some insect populations are actually moved around by those large weather disturbance events. And so some of those things are shifting where these populations might land or, or maybe there's an invasive um, insect that gets pushed over by this uh, weather disturbance, lands in the area, begins to proliferate in our native ecosystem and pushes out our native pollinators. So there's a, a myriad of ways that climate change um, can and, and is uh, impacting that invertebrate population. Habitat loss is a key driver of a decrease in species overall um, across almost all species across the globe. And that's not just a direct result of them not having a place to live, it's also uh, degradation of existing habitat. So, you know, <clears throat> we might say, okay, well, we still have flowers in our yard, right? So, so we're still providing habitat for pollinators, but we'll talk in a, in a second here about how that's not a one-to-one -one comparison. We've also seen a, a drastic increase over the past, um, you know, 50 or so years of the use of pesticides, not just for agricultural purposes, but in home landscapes. So where, you know, pesticides have been used for hundreds of years in, in agricultural operations, we now have many more pesticides available to and being used by folks in their home landscapes. And so, um, you know, a lot of these pesticides are going to have off-target impacts on um, pollinators, on invertebrate pollinators. Um, in particular, are bees with uh, neonicotinoid um, pesticides. So that's something to be, um, something that is also a potential driver of this decline. Invasive plants, as plants travel around the globe, um, usually attached to humans or as a byproduct of human travel, um, these plants proliferate and take over native ecosystems and reduce the overall diversity and thereby reducing the diversity of the pollinator populations as well. So kind of all of these four factors kind of, kind of lead to this overall um, decrease in um, insect diversity and abundance globally. So, so that's why we should be worried, right? We talked about in the last slide kind of what role they play in the ecosystem, why they're important, the fact that they are economically important. And so since we know that some of the um, choices we're making in our home landscapes are potentially impacting these populations, that's why, why we should care about um, what we do and how we can maybe modify our behaviors to, to help pollinators. Okay, let's just jump, double check in the chat there. So um, one of the things that I, I wanted to point out, you know, a lot of people, when they first moved to Florida, there's a misconception about what Florida is from a uh, habitat standpoint, right? Um, a lot of people move to Florida because they like the beach and they're used to, um, you know, kind of palm trees and sand and this idea that, you know, all of Florida is a big beach for us to go play on. Um, and that's actually not true of the majority of the state, right? If you think about the coastline of Florida, the coastline is just gonna hug right along the edges. The interior of Florida is not um, going to have that same kind of look and feel. Uh, we do have some palms in the interior of Florida, but they're gonna be cabbage palms. Um, you know, they're, they're not gonna be um, kind of these large royals or Washingtonians or especially not coconut palms, right? So the majority of the interior of Florida is going to look a lot like this uh, photo on the upper left hand side of the screen. This is actually out at um, Duet Preserve here in Manatee County. We are in Florida in the um, kind of southeastern portion of what remains of the longleaf pine ecosystem. And this was predominated by longleaf pine as well as sort of wet and dry 
prairies and flatwoods. And flatwoods are usually have a lot of saw palmetto. Um, but one of the things that is true of all of these ecosystems throughout our southeastern coastal plain is that um, there is a high diversity of plants in these ecosystems. If you look within like one square meter of a longleaf pine uh, ecosystem that's healthy, you can find over 50 species of, of plants. And that's grasses, that's wildflowers, that's legumes. Um, so, so we really have a, a, a history in Florida of having this very rich, diverse landscape. And so I, I kind of I zoomed in here, highlighted. So this might look kind of monochromatic to a human, but when you look down here, this is a, a close-up of some goldenrod. And here's, um, this is a honeybee, uh, so a non-native bee, but here's a bee visiting goldenrod that you would find in an ecosystem like this. And to a bee or um, some other kind of invertebrate, there's going to be <clears throat> a wide range of colors and textures and things that are going to attract them within um, kind of our, our natural ecosystem, the one that has a broad variety or diversity of plants. When you look here at the right hand side, this is a, a turf grass lawn and to an invertebrate, a turf grass lawn is going to look like this. It's going to be pretty bland. It's going to be, um, there, there aren't going to be large flowers to attract the attention of those pollinators. So, you know, we like the look of green. We, we like that kind of um, nice flat green expanse. But to a bee or to another kind of um, invertebrate, this is going to be a really boring landscape for them. So we went from something more like this, like what we have with our flatwoods and our, and our wet and dry prairies, to something that's very um, low in diversity and lacks uh, flowering uh, characteristics. So what can we do? Um, there are a few different things that we can do as individuals in our home landscapes to kind of help um, stem the tide, if you will, of, of habitat loss for our, for our pollinators. Um, the first one is just increasing the use of native plants in your landscape. Um, most of the pollinators that are native to our area will have evolved with these particular species of plants, right, because they're native to our area. Um, and so as you increase the use of these native plants in your home landscape, you're going to encourage more of those pollinators um, to, to find them and, and to pollinate and um, you know, hang around, maybe reproduce in your yard. Um, I know when I first moved into, into my yard, it was turf grass and areca palm and some periwinkles. And so over the course of the last five years, you know, we have drastically changed the, the landscape. I have at least 15 different species of wildflowers. I have flowering shrubs. I have small flowering trees. And I didn't, I didn't go seek out pollinators. I didn't, I didn't like go catch some in a natural area and release them in, in my yard. But now I have, you know, 80 different kinds of pollinators that I'll see over the course of, of a summer and a fall when everything's in bloom, just because I've, I've increased that diversity and availability of native plants. So increasing the use of native plants is very important. Plant a broader diversity of just flowering plants. The plants don't necessarily have to be native in order for them to attract pollinators. Um, so if you want to incorporate some non-native flowering plants into your landscape, that, that is absolutely fine as well. Just make sure that you're kind of increasing your diversity of your plants. And the reason that we want to encourage a diversity of flowering plants is that you'll get a broader diversity of pollinators who are going to either specialize for those types of plants or they'll be more interested um, because your yard will be like sending off neon uh, signs everywhere saying, look at this flower, look at this flower. It'll be really uh, much more interesting to the pollinators than, than just having two or three different types of plants. If we think about, uh, you know, a typical neighborhood, let's say you, you live in a neighborhood that was built in the last 10 or 15 years, you're going to find maybe seven different plants um, throughout that neighborhood, right? You'll have some turf grass, 
you might have some Ixora, you'll probably have some Schefflera, you might have a live oak that was required uh, to be planted as a street tree. Um, <clears throat> Maybe if you're lucky, you'll have some like flex lily or something like that. But beyond that, the plant palette for um, new developments is, is very, um, I'll say bland. There's, there's not a broad diversity and there's not, there's not a lot of flowering plants. So um, again, increasing that diversity is going to be a really great step that you can take. Include plants that flower throughout the year as well. So when you're thinking about the plants that you're going to plant, you know, think about things like whether you want it to be perennial or annual, if you want it to reseed or not reseed, but also think about when it blooms. If you only have plants that bloom during a few months um, in the spring or summer, then uh, you're not providing habitat year round for those pollinators. So you can, you can definitely find plants that are going to flower throughout the different seasons and that way you can, you can provide that um, benefit to pollinators throughout the year. You want to limit your use of pesticides. So um, one of the great services that we provide at, um, at the extension office and almost every extension office through the state provides this service is that if you take a picture of a bug in your yard that you're worried about and you bring it in to our plant clinic or email it in um, to your horticulture agent, they'll help you figure out what it is, uh, whether or not it's a problem, and they'll recommend some measures um, that you can take to help control it if it's something that needs control. So remember, you know, some of the photos that I shared of, of Florida pollinators include things that are not necessarily what we think of typically as like our bees, and, our typical bees and butterfly. So um, it's important to know what you're looking at. It's important to know whether or not it is really going to be a problem. Um, and then to utilize a strategy that we call integrated pest management, IPM. And integrated pest management is going to encourage you to use the least toxic option first um, or you know, the least impactful option first. And so look at things like mechanical removal. Can you just, is it caterpillars on your tomatoes? You can go and squish them right, or knock them off into a bucket of soapy water rather than having to go out and, and spray your um, plants with some kind of a pesticide. Um, if you do need to use some kind of a pesticide, we can make recommendations for those pesticides that will be, um, have the least off-target effects and um, will we'll be able to help you through kind of that application process as well. So how can you apply this pesticide to make sure that you're doing it in the in the best way to make sure that it's only um, going to deal with the insect problem that you have and not cause broader problems. And two, I, I encourage people to rethink your, um, your kind of personal aesthetic. Um, you know, yes, once a year you're probably going to get aphids on the new growth of some of your plants. I usually let them be because I know that one or two weeks later, I go out and I look at that same plant and it's going to be covered in, in ladybugs because those ladybugs are going to eat those aphids. So um, if you can live with a little bit of damage on your plants for a little bit of time, often you're going to um, see kind of some of those um, natural predators kind of coming out there and, and taking care of the problem for you. And then the last thing that I would encourage people to do is to just decrease your overall percentage of turf grass, right? I'm not telling you that turf grass is bad or that you should get rid of your turf grass lawn. Turf grass absolutely has its place in the landscape, right? I, um, you know, you want a place for your kids to play ball, you, um, you know, you have a dog and it's the only thing that will survive when your dog is, is running around on that part of your lawn. Um, it, it does a great job, a well-maintained turf grass lawn, does a great job at filtering nutrients and, and holding the soil in place. So I don't want people to think that, um, that I'm anti-turf grass. I just want to have people consider the option of decreasing your total percentage of, of lawn surface. And the reason for that, again, is because it is monochromatic to a pollinator. It is not exciting. It provides no, um, no flowers for those pollinators to visit. And so you're less likely to attract those pollinators to your landscape. 
that's from a pollination perspective. There are other good reasons to reduce your overall percentage of turf grass as well, and that has to do with water conservation and maintenance and things like that. So if you do want to convert your lawn, how are you going to go about doing that? Um, let me double check, but I saw a couple of things come up in the chat. Um, yes, muley grass is, um, is great. It, it's, an, it's a good native um, plant. Somebody mentioned um, muley grass is used pretty frequently. That's good. It's, it's especially good because it's drought tolerant um, and you will, um, uh, it, it's good for many reasons, um, but it's not a huge pollinator attractor. Um, so I would still encourage even if you have muley grass to, to you know, increase the number of plants that you have that are flowering. Um, if you have a piece of your lawn, maybe let's say that you have a section of lawn that gets some afternoon shade from your oak, sycamore, what have you tree. And because it gets a little bit, you know, it's like half in shade in the afternoon, it tends to be thin. It tends to be kind of leggy and weeds are infiltrating it. That's a really great candidate for replacing that section of lawn with something that's going to be more attractive to pollinators. And, you know, what you can do in that instance, because you already have kind of a thinning area of lawn, is you can actually just go ahead and interplant among what's already existing there. Um, and, and then I definitely encourage you to utilize plants that are a one gallon size because you're gonna have a higher success rate, right? You don't wanna go out and buy a bunch of tiny little plants, put them in the ground, um, seedlings, and then have them have half of them fail, which is a, a pretty normal um, risk when, when you're planting smaller plants. Um, I would encourage you to spend a little bit more money up front, get the one gallon size, put those in the ground, and then you're more likely to have um, success, especially if you're interplanting. So that, but again, that's, that's in areas where, let's say you have kind of a sparse lawn to begin with. If you have a nice lush lawn, but you have a certain section of it that you think, you know, I don't really use that space very much, or maybe you have a, um, maybe you have a section of lawn that's in between like a, a walkway and a driveway and you think hey you know this this pizza pie slice here is not really useful I don't walk on it very often maybe I could try taking this grass out and and replacing it with uh, some pollinator plants and so that's going to be where you want to remove the sod in in some manner um, you can get a sod cutter um, that is laborious so you can also smother the sod. Um, you could take several sheets of cardboard, cover the entire area, and leave it for about 60 days. Um, and then that will um, most likely kill it all off. Grass is pretty resilient though, so you may still have some rhizomes under there. Another option is to cover it with cardboard and then cover it with mulch and then let it sit for a month or so and then um, plant into, um, into that cardboard and, and mulch mix. Now you may have some issues there uh, with over time the mulch might get um, kind of compacted and, and as it does that occasionally it can become hydrophobic and so you may go out there and try to water and then you see that your water is running off of that kind of thick packed mulch on top of the cardboard. So if you can I would recommend maybe trying interplanting and then um, putting your mulch down or removing the sod in, entirely. Those are going to be your best options to, to kind of have something that looks a little bit cleaner and you don't run into the issues with the hydrophobic um, mulch. Recognize your aesthetic expectations. So it's a really good idea to take some time to browse through the um, plant options that you have. And I'll give you some resources here in a little bit where you can um, where you can do some research and find plants that are going to be good for you in your landscape. Um, but recognize what, what you expect your yard to look like. Think about how this pollinator garden will fit in with the rest of the space um, or with the re rest of your landscaping. Does your neighborhood have requirements for 
um, you know, specific look and feel. Um, if that's the case, you may consider putting your pollinator garden in the backyard um, or uh, utilizing like a raised bed um, for, uh, for your pollinator garden. Also, um, if you are having difficulty because of your neighborhood restrictions, I definitely recommend using um, large containers. You can do a lot of really neat things with spacing large containers throughout your landscape and, and um, you know, planting three or four different species, maybe even five, depending on the size of the container and, and really get a um, kind of like mini pollinator garden set up throughout your yard in, in containers. If you, if you absolutely uh, can't convert your lawn or you're having difficulty doing so. Also, I would recommend starting small. So we wanna make sure, you know, as gardeners in Florida, it's really easy to get discouraged, right? We have mild winters. We have uh, two extremely different seasons. We have a wet season and a dry season. Um, because of our high overnight temperatures, we have a lot of issues with fungus, fungal pathogens. So Florida is really friendly to fungus, it's really friendly to insects. So gardening in Florida can be a challenge. And I don't want to discourage you from gardening. So I want to encourage you to start small. Um, think you know, there's research that shows that as little as 10 square feet within your home landscape is significant when it comes to um, encouraging pollinators to, um, to be part of, of your landscape, to, to visit your landscape. So, so start small, have some success, feel good about yourself, and then move on and maybe try to incorporate this in a, in a bigger way throughout your landscape. Are there any questions before I move on? see. So we've talked about this already um, a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of give you some more steps. If you don't want to convert your actual lawn, you want to just, maybe you've already got landscape beds and you want to know what to do. Again, add native flowering plants to your existing landscape beds. These can be um, you know, tucked in, uh, in, a, in, in rows in front of your shrubs. Let's say maybe you have a row of shuffleras and you decide to put, you know, pick three or four species of flowering annuals that are native and, and, you, and you tuck them in all along that, um, the base of that hedge. Shuffleras tend to get leggy and sparse at the bottom anyway. So if you, if you add in that nice border of native flowering plants, you're increasing your friendliness to pollinators while you are also kind of covering up that kind of problem Shuffleara base. Um, choose a combination. Remember, think about annuals and perennials. Annuals, especially native annuals, tend to reseed pretty well. So um, things that are uh, that are going to reseed uh, really well and can occasionally become kind of uh, annoying might be things like salvia coccinea, um, things like um, gallardia pulchella, so, uh, that's blanket flower, and tropical sage. Um, so, so kind of maybe ask the person at the nursery who you're buying the plants from, say, hey, is this going to reseed a lot? Do I need to worry about it um, kind of spreading out throughout my yard? So that's something you might want to consider. But do choose, choose a, a combination of annuals and perennials. And also remember to um, incorporate plants that flower throughout the year. Use a diverse plant palette. I can't say it enough. Diversity in plants is going to be really important to support a broad diversity of pollinator species. Minimize the use of all pesticides. So again, only use them when absolutely necessary and contact your extension office for information about which pesticides are safe to use. Um, many pesticides will say on the label, and this is something for, for um, folks to know, the pesticide label is actually um, federal law, and those are regulated by the EPA, and they go through a really long vetting process. So the instructions on the label of a pesticide container are actually um, law, and if you apply that pesticide um, out of accordance with what the directions say on the label, you're actually breaking the law. So it's really important to, to read that label. I know that sometimes it can be difficult. You get a, um, you know, a spray bottle of pesticide from 
uh, your local big box store and, it, and you pull it out, it's like a long can of tiny, tiny text. Um, a tip there is that most of the time you can also access those online in a PDF format that will allow you to zoom in so you don't have to try to break out the magnifying glass and, and read that tiny text on the pesticide label. Um, but the label will tell you how to apply, how much to apply, when to apply, what kind of personal protective equipment you should wear, so whether you should wear long sleeves or eyeglasses or um, closed-toed shoes when you're applying, things like that. Um, they're going to let you know whether you can spray that pesticide when plants are flowering or not. And if they tell you not to spray when plants are flowering, that's because they have documented negative impacts on pollinators. Okay, so pay a lot of attention to that. Um, I would also encourage people to minimize your overall maintenance schedule if you can. Um, and the reason I say this is because a lot of um, you know, there are different kinds of shrubs and plants that are in really typical Florida landscapes that do have flowers on them, but oftentimes they're on such a regular maintenance schedule that the amount of flowers per plant are generally um, pretty sparse because they've been trimmed um, too frequently. So, you know, think about those um, hedges that like to be nice little boxes or people like them to be nice little boxes. A lot of times they're shearing off kind of that, um, the newer growth and this is often where the flowers would grow. So if you can minimize your maintenance schedule, maybe reduce the number of times per year that you are trimming these um, hedges or bushes or small trees, and also recognizing that you should wait until after they're done flowering before you do that, um, that annual or biannual or triannual maintenance, um, whatever um, you need to do for that, for that particular plant. Um, I would also encourage people to recognize, you know, when it is important to trim plants, right? Um, so a lot of us kind of think that they, they have to be trimmed in order for them to, to grow healthy. Um, that's a misconception that I've heard many, many times. But if you think about a plant in its, in its natural environment, right, nobody's going out there and, and cutting it with shears and it's gonna grow just fine and it's gonna grow to its mature height, right? Is it gonna be disturbed by things like branches falling, high winds? Absolutely. But, um, but plants don't need to be pruned in order for them to grow uh, in a healthy manner. Um, what we do when we prune plants is we encourage them to take the shapes that we want them to have, right? So um, think about ways that you can minimize that maintenance. Again, focusing on um, pruning after flowering and just kind of reducing that, that overall um, amount of times you're trimming things. And I would encourage you to check out Florida Friendly Landscaping because while um, Florida Friendly Landscaping's main goal is water conservation and water quality, there are additional um, ecosystem impacts that are beneficial, not just for pollinators, but also for other kinds of species, birds. Um, so, you know, these are nine principles that guide our practices leading to more sustainable landscapes in general. And so if you uh, are looking to convert your current yard to a Florida friendly landscape, if you need help um, selecting plants or learning more about uh, your soil, your soil type, your water, anything like that, we're here to help you. And here in Manatee County, we offer what's called the Landscape Assistance Program. And we'll actually walk you through a very intensive process. We do a soil test with you. Um, we do a site visit. We, we look at what's going on um, in your landscape and we make uh, specific recommendations for you, for your landscape, for how you can implement these Florida Friendly Landscaping Principles. So if you're interested in that, give us a call to find out more. Um, we are on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. We're on all the things. Um, but we have been recently um, uploading a lot more videos to our YouTube channel. And so I definitely encourage you to check us out there and see some of the other webinars that we've offered in, in a similar vein to this one. Um, I wanted to go through these resources with you before I conclude. The first one is lawntowildflowers.org. And you can also just search in your um, in your apps for Lawn to Wildflowers. There's a mobile app available for this. Um, this is uh, 
host of resources that are going to walk you through kind of where you can buy wildflower seeds, how you go about converting um, turf grass into wildflower and pollinator habitat, and also teaches you about our native pollinators. Um, this is all based on research that's um, has been and is being conducted at Florida Gulf Coast University. And the folks down there have done a really great job putting this app together. So I encourage you to um, take a look at that. And um, if you need help finding plants, I didn't, you know, I only had uh, about 45 minutes today. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't just have slides and slides of plants, which I mean, I could do because I love plants, but <laughs> um, you can definitely go and search through lots of um, different databases. FloridaYards.org, you can search the database there by selecting that it's, um, that it's a pollinator plant. Um, you can select whether it's native or not native, whether it needs water, not very much water, whether you have a sunny site or not. So FloridaYards.org is going to provide you with a list of plants based on your criteria, um, and those are all going to be recommended Florida-friendly plants. The Florida Native Plant Society, if you're looking specifically for native plants, which again, I definitely encourage you to incorporate more natives into your landscape. Um, the Florida Native Plant Society, if you go to fnps.org slash plants, they also have a really great searchable database. Um, you can select by your region. So you can say you're in North, Central, or South Florida. Um, and you can, it'll split up the recommendations of plants into things like um, trees, shrubs, um, wildflowers, etc. And you can look through those. Um, if you're looking for places to, to purchase native plants, go to the Florida Association of Native Nurseries, FANN.org. Um, and that's where you can type in your zip code and it'll pull up a list of the um, closest native nurseries to you. And that's where you can go find those native plants. Because a lot of the plants that you're going to find just kind of generally, um, you know, in particular at the big box stores are not going to be native. They may say things like Florida friendly on them. Um, they may say things like zero escaping on them, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those are going to be um, the the species that, that we would we would encourage. Um, and also something to be aware of is to definitely look at those tags on the plants that you're purchasing and make sure that they um, don't say that they have been pre-treated with a, an insecticide because some plants have. And um, I know of a few instances where folks were buying milkweed specifically because they wanted to um, kind of host monarch caterpillars. Um, and those plants had been pre-treated with some insecticides and all the caterpillars died. So, um, so just be aware that that is something that occasionally happens. And so you should read the little um, plant tag that comes with your plants. And then if you're looking for more broadly um, information about pollinators, about invertebrates, about how invertebrate conservation is kind of playing out on a global scale, um, I definitely encourage you to check out Xerxes.org. That's the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. And with that, I am done. So I'll stop my share. Let's see if we have... Thank you, Alisa. That was great. We do have a few questions. Before we go into questions, I just want to say that some of the same services that uh, Manatee County Extension Office provide, that's also Sarasota County uh, provides. They might be called differently, but they're the same. They do home visits, they test your soil, and that's across the state. So if you are in another county, please visit your Extension Office, and somebody like Alisa will help you out to have a friendly garden and for pollinators. So that's awesome. All right, a few questions. Please keep typing them in. I have one here that was typed in the Q&A box. It says, what about wind? Does wind serve as a pollinator and do the winds and insects pollinate the same plants? Uh, so the answer to that is sometimes they pollinate the same plants. Um, there are some plants that rely on wind dispersal. Um, that's typically more often with their seeds though. So, so if you think about a plant like, um, uh, the one that comes to mind for me is saltbush, Baccarus halimifolia. It gets a puff of white um, when the seeds are ready and the wind blows and, and takes the seeds away. So oftentimes wind is more responsible for seed dispersal than it is for pollination. But there are some plants that have male and female reproductive um, 
flowers on the same plant. And in those cases, wind can serve as a uh, pollination um, vector because it kind of moves the pollen around on that same plant. Great. Okay, another question just came in. What was the last website for the xerces.org? Yeah, that's the that's the Xerxes Foundation um, the, or the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Okay, did that answer the question? If not, um, if you want more specific, just visit it or keep asking. Another question, what about mulch? What's the best mulch to use in terms of sustainability and, you know, efficiency for your garden? Uh, I am a big fan of Melaleuca mulch. Um, the main reason being because the Melaleuca tree is an invasive tree in South Florida. Um, you can find it in, in our area as well. And um, it is harvested to be turned into mulch, um, which is much better than, you know, if you, can, if you can create a market for invasive plants, I'm all about it. Um, and not only that, it's a, it's a good mulch. It doesn't break down too fast. It's, a, um, it's, a, it's still a natural mulch, so it's going to um, slowly over time provide organic matter to your soil. I would stay away from cypress mulch. Um, it might look pretty, but there's no guarantee that it has been harvested in a sustainable fashion. Um, I would also tend to steer clear of any of the inorganic things like rubber mulches um, or the dyed mulches. So, you know, you want to look for something that is a, um, a natural material um, and is going to break down slowly over time. Um, some things that are great for, for uh, a quick mulch layer um, that are going to break down really quickly are pine straw. If you need some mulch real quick and you don't want to spend a lot of money, pine straw is a great option, but it is going to break down in, a, in as little as six months. Um, so, so that's definitely something to consider. And then things like pine bark, while pine bark is a very attractive mulch, um, if you have it in an area that um, could be susceptible to heavy rainfall, they do tend to kind of float <laughs> and, and move out of your landscape. Um, so, so those are some considerations with mulch. Great. Another question. So, person loves butterflies, monarchs especially, but caterpillars keep eating all the plants. Uh, so, how do you balance between, you know, increasing pollinator garden and then? Yeah, that that is a problem um, for for folks especially that are trying to attract uh, monarch butterflies. Um, I know that. It's really easy for folks to get the um, tropical milkweed. And so they, they get a whole bunch of it and they get a whole bunch of monarchs. What I would say to that is if you increase the diversity of plants you have in your landscape, you're gonna increase the diversity of pollinators that visit it. So if you just have a slew of milkweed plants, you're gonna get mainly monarchs. But if you also have things like passion vine, then you'll get gulf fritillaries. Um, you know, so, so increasing the diversity of host plants you have in your landscape will allow you to have a broader diversity of pollinator insects. Okay. Another question. What about pets in terms of, you know, some bees and some wasps attracted to pollinator garden? Should we be concerned about? Um, well, you know, it's something to be concerned about. You don't want a wasp nest right by your back door or by your dog's dog door or something like that. Um, I will say I have um, two children under the age of five and two dogs and um, we have very few negative interactions with pollinators. Um, you know, one of the reasons is because my kids are all like, "Ooh, a bee, so cool. And they like stay back and look at it. And um, <laughs> so they, they kind of know not to go swat them and things like that. But with dogs, it's a little bit harder. Um, I definitely have had a dog come in with a swollen up nose before. Um, you know, if you have an area of the yard where, where pets or kids frequent, then, you know, maybe keep that area free of quite so many flowering plants and maybe focus more on like front yard, corner of a front yard, something like that. Put it in an area that's not going to receive a lot of foot traffic. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really bad about this. I have tons of native flowering plants like right along my front walk <laughs> um, leading up to my house. So I'm constantly walking through a, you know, maelstrom of bzzz. <laughs> um, but I still have, have yet to be stung. Um, it's been, been several years since I've been stung. I think most of the time they're just, maybe they're so drunk on nectar, they don't notice that I'm there. <laughs> awesome. 
you're talking about um, containers for your plants. My, my neighbor has a canoe that he doesn't use anymore and he filled it up and he has a beautiful garden. So there's, there's nice. a lot of ways to get creative. Yeah, absolutely. We actually have a, um, uh, our Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator has a presentation called Waste Not, Want Not, and she focuses on some of those kind of alternative containers. There's a lot of fun stuff you can do. I have a kitchen sink in my front yard that's full of aloe. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Well, we have, okay, so some more thank you. I think um, that's the question. So again, thank you so much, Alisa. I'm just going to wait one more minute to see if there's another question coming up. If not, Thank you so much for participating. Uh, you know where to find us. Where is your office located, Lisa? Uh, we're in Palmetto, right across from Manatee High School at the Manatee County Fairgrounds. Great. And the uh, uh, extension office in Sarasota County is at Twin Lakes Park. So you can come visit us. We're open. Or you can call us or visit our website. Well, thank you again. And have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.